The Workers Fight Against Fascism by Karl Korsch. Quote, democracy, end quote, a self-styled name for the traditional setup of present-day capitalist society is fighting a losing battle against the attacking forces of fascism, Nazism, Falangism, Iron Guardism, and so forth. The workers stand by. They seem to say, again, that what their predecessors, the revolutionary workers in 1849, said in regard to the final struggle between the leaders of a self-defeated liberal democracy and the quasi-fascist chief of a new Napoleonic imperialism, Louis Bonaparte. They say, as interpreted by Marx and Engels, quote, this time it's a matter to be settled among the bosses, end quote. The, quote, secret, underlying the verbal battles between, quote, totalitarianism and, quote, anti-totalitarianism, and the more important diplomatic and military struggle between the Axis and the Anglo-American group of imperialist powers, is the historical fact that the worst and the most intimate foe of, of democracy today is not Herr Hitler, but, quote, democracy, end quote, itself. Yet this is not a problem of, quote, split personality, end quote, nor can it be explained as a, quote, inferiority complex, end quote, or a, quote, father complex, end quote, or any of the other lofty creations of Freudian psychology. It is not even a conflict between old age and youth, as Mr. Lindbergh puts it, but puts it between the, quote, it is not even a conflict between old age and youth, as Mrs. Lindbergh put it, puts it, between, quote, the forces of the past and the forces of the future, end quote. The real facts underlying all these high-sounding phrases are to be sought nowhere else but re-enter Marx in the material basis of all ideological conflicts, that is, in the economic structure of contemporary society, or in the impasse that modern capitalism has reached in the present phase of its historical development. Ambiguities of Democracy We must not, however, jump to conclusions. Before we explain the basic reasons for the ambiguities of, quote, democracy, end quote, in its present, quote, fight, end quote, against the fascist challenge, we must deal somewhat more closely with the phenomenon itself. We must show that they assume split, though it does not exist in any psychological, anthropological, or cosmic sense, does yet exist as a very real split in what, for want of a better term, we shall continue to call the, quote, class consciousness, end quote, of the ruling strata of present-day society. We shall not waste our time with a discussion of the more conspicuous forms in which this condition manifests itself, a worldwide war between two equally capitalistic parts of that one big capitalistic power that rules the world today, and the open division of each of the fighting parties into mutually opposing factions. In spite of the fact that in our, quote, in our truly, quote, Chinese, end quote, age, every party and every faction endeavors above all to, quote, save face, end quote, by hiding its own and borrowing its opponent's slogans, and by pretending, quote, not to offer any solution, end quote. It is sufficiently clear today that the same divisions that became visible in the collapse of Norway, Holland, Belgium, and France exist and develop in various forms both in the actually fighting and the so-called neutral, quote, democracies, end quote. This war is sufficient to prove that the present, quote, war, end quote, is fundamentally a, quote, civil war, end quote, and will be decided in the future, just as it has been up to now, not by the relative military or even the economic strength of the fighting countries, but by the help that the attacking force of fascism will get from its allies within the, quote, democratic, end quote, countries. The main task of the following paragraphs is to deal with the less conspicuous manner in which this internal strife pervades the, quote, conscience, of, end quote, of every group, of every institution, as it were, of every single member of present-day, quote, democratic, end quote, society. The American public today hates and fears the growing threat of fascism. It takes a fervent interest in the various official and non-official forms of the search for, quote, Trojan horses, End quote, and fit, end quote, fifth columnists, end quote. It girds itself for the defense 
of the democratic traditions against the attack that is brought near our shores by the progress of the Nazi war in Europe, Africa, and Asia, at the same time an increasing part of this American public is secretly convinced of the several material benefits that could be derived from the so-called elite, and to a lesser extent, for the mass of the people as well. Oh, excuse me. At the same time, an increasing part of this American public is secretly convinced of the several material benefits that could be derived for the so-called elite and, to a lesser extent, for the masses of the people as well, from an acceptance of fascist methods in the field of economics, politics, and maybe even for the promotion of the so-called higher cultural and ideological interests. It is apt to, reg it is apt to regard the very institutions and ideals for which it is prepared to, quote, fight, end quote, as a kind of, quote, faux fra, end quote, of production, of conducting the business of an efficient modern administration, and of fighting a modern war. It never seriously considered, quote, democratic, end quote, methods as an adequate means of running an important private business, or for that matter, a business like trade union. It would prefer, on the whole, to have its cake and eat it too, that is, to apply those amazingly successful new methods to the fullest advantage, and yet at the same time somehow retain a workable, quote, maximum, end quote, of the traditional, quote, democratic, end quote, amenities. It is easy to see that this more or less platonic attachment to the great democratic tradition in spite of the assumed greater material advantages of the fascist methods, offers small comfort for the real prospects of, a dem of democracy in times of a serious and hitherto unconquerable crisis. In fact, an increasing number of the foremost spokesmen, the most vociferous, vociferous quote, experts, end quote, and the truest friends of democracy begin to express some grave doubts as to whether their unyielding allegiance to the, quote, underlying values of the democratic American tradition, end quote, has not already degenerated into a costly hobby that the nation, the nation may, or in the long run, may not be able to afford. This sentiment became most evident in the all-too-ready response of the greater part of the American, quote, democratic, end quote, public to Anne Lindbergh's booklet. There are some definite fields in which even the most fervent opposers of the ruthlessness of the fascist principles admit an undeniable superiority of totalitarian achievements. There is, for example, universal admiration of the splendid work done by the Nazi propaganda. There is widespread belief in the full success of the Nazi attack against the most incurable plagues of modern democratic society. Fascism is supposed to have abolished permanent mass unemployment, and by one bold stroke to have released the brakes out of out. <laughs> and fascism is supposed to have abolished permanent mass unemployment, and by one bold stroke to have released the brakes put on free enterprise by wage disputes and labor unrest. There is a tacit agreement that an all-round adoption of fascist methods will be necessary in time of war. An economic pythia. The most striking testimony to present day democracy's implicit belief in an overwhelming superiority of fascist methods is to be found in an official document published in June 1939 by the National Resources Committee that deals with the basic characteristics of the structure of the American economy. We shall make ample use of this report when we approach the main question of our present investigation. For the moment, however, we shall disregard the momentous discoveries made by Dr. Gardner C. Means and his staff with regard to the present state of American economy. We shall deal exclusively with the forecast of the chances for a survival of the democratic principle that is revealed in the general statements contained in the introduction and conclusion. The authors of the report start from impressive from the authors of the report start from impressive description of the well-known 
failure, end quote, of the present economic system to use its gigantic resources effectively. Quote, resources are wasted or used inefficiently, ineffectively as parts of the organization get out of adjustment with each other or as the organization fails to adjust to new conditions as individuals fail to find or are prevented from finding the most useful field of activity as material resources are unused or as their effective use is impeded by human barriers and as the most effective technology is not used or its use is prevented." End quote. They attempt to estimate and picture the quote, magnitude of waste end quote, that resulted from this failure both during the Depression and the preceding non-Depression years. According to this estimate, the Depression loss in national income due to the idleness of men and machines from 1929 to 1937 was, quote, in the magnitude of $200 billion worth of goods and services, end quote. This extra income would have been enough to provide, quote, a new $6,000 house for every family in the country, end quote. At this cost, quote, the entire railroad system of the country could have been scrapped and rebuilt five times over, end quote. It is equivalent to the cost of rebuilding the whole of the existing, quote, agricultural and industrial plant, end quote, of the nation. Even in the peak pre-depression year 1929, both production and national income could have been increased 19% by merely putting to work the men and machines that were idle in that year, even without the introduction of improved techniques of production. The authors then go on with the, quote, impact, end quote, of this waste upon the community as reflected in the development of a, quote, sense of social frustration and, end quote, justified social unrest and unavoidable friction, end quote. They begin, however, to show a wavering in their democratic convictions when they proceed in the following paragraph to discuss the, quote, tremendous opportunity, end quote, and the, quote, great challenge, end quote, that this very waste of resources and manpower presents for the American nation today. The, quote, great challenge, end quote, for America, for democracy, the great the, quote, great challenge, end quote, for democracy, assumes at once the sinister features of an impending tragedy. Quote, how long this opportunity will be open to the American democracy involves a serious question. The opportunity for a higher standard of living is so great, the social frustrations from the failure to obtain it so real, that other means will undoubtedly be sought if a democratic solution is not worked out. The time for finding such a solution is not unlimited, end quote. And they reveal their inmost sentiment as to the probabilities of a, quote, democratic solution, end quote, of that tremendous task by the very language in which they finally, quote, state the problem, end quote, arising from the results of their investigation, quote, this problem, the basic problem facing economic statesmanship today can be stated as follows. How can we get effective use of our resources, yet, at the same time, preserve the underlying values in our tradition of liberty and democracy? How can we employ our unemployed? How can we use our plant and equipment to the full? How can we take advantage of the modern technology, yet in all this make the individual the source of value and individual fulfillment in society the basic objective? How can we obtain effective organization of resources, yet at the same time retain the maximum freedom of individual action. This same defeatist, sent end quote, this same defeatist sentiment pervades, as it were, the whole of this otherwise most valuable official document. There is nowhere an unambiguous attempt to claim for the democratic principles any material value or usefulness for restoring the good old days of capitalism or for bringing about an even greater expansion of the productive forces of the American economic community. There is nothing but a sentimental craving for a policy that would not be altogether incompatible with a more or less verbal allegiance to a few remnants of the, quote, democratic, end quote, end quote, liberal, end quote, traditions, and what might yet work as well as the fascist methods, which they never question. 
Thus the whole of the proud attempt to conquer a new world of prosperity and of full use of resources and manpower for American democracy boils down to a pronouncement about the result of the impending struggle between democracy and fascism that in its sinister ambiguity reveals the well-known oracle of the priestess of Delphi. Quote, if Croesus sets out to conquer the country beyond the Halles, he will destroy a great empire, end quote, said the Oracle of Ancient Greece. Quote, if the present government of the USA sets out to conquer the problems of unused resources and of mass unemployment, it will destroy an important form of government, end quote, echoes the economic oracle of our time. A new fighting ground. It appears from the preceding observations that the workers are quite right if they think twice before they listen to the generous invitations extended to them from every quarter, including most of their former leaders, to forget for the time being about their own complaints against capital and to join wholeheartedly the fight against the common enemy. The workers cannot participate in, quote, democracy's fight against fascism, end quote, for the simple reason that there is no such fight. To fight against fascism means for the workers in the hitherto democratic countries to fight first of all against the democratic branch of fascism within their own countries. To begin their own fight against the new and more oppressive form of capitalism that is concealed in the various forms of pseudo-socialism offered to them today. They have first to free themselves from the idea that it might still be possible for present-day capitalism to, quote, turn the clock back, end quote, and to return to a traditional pre-fascist -cap, pre capitalism. They must learn to fight fascism on its own ground, which, as we have said before, is entirely different from the very popular, but in fact self-destructive advice that the anti-fascists should learn to fight fascism by adopting fascist methods. To step from the ground on which the workers' class struggle against capitalism was waged in the preceding epoch to the ground on which it must be continued today presupposes full insight into a historical fact that is not less a fact because it has served as a theoretical basis for the claims of fascism. This historical fact that has already that has finally arrived today, this historical fact that has finally arrived today can be described as a first approach, either negatively or positively, in any of the following terms. End of the market. End of competitive capitalism. Quote, end of economic man. End quote. Triumph of bureaucracy. Of administrative rule. Of monopoly capitalism. Era of Russian four-year plans. Italian wheat battles. German Wehrwirtschaft. Triumph of state capitalism over private property and individual enterprise. The tendency towards this transformation was first envisaged by the early socialists in their criticism of the millennial hopes of the bourgeois apostles of free trade. It was later more and more neglected by the socialist writers in their attempt to adopt, adopt their theories to the needs of the progressive fractions of the bourgeoisie. When it was finally revived around the turn of the present century, it was already destined, as we can see today, to serve not the purposes of the socialist revolution, but rather the aims of the imperceptibly growing counter-revolution. We shall presently see that today any further denial of the accomplished fact has become impossible, even for hard-boiled defenders of the traditional dreams of bourgeois economy. Corporate Community For a more detailed description and factual confirmation of this general statement, we turn again to the above-discussed document, which contains, as far as the writer can see, by far the most comprehensive, the most reliable, and at the same time the most dramatically presented information on the subject. 
When this government report on the structure of the American economy first became known to the American public, the chief sensation was created by its careful statistical proof that even the boldest estimates previously made were far below the degree of monopolistic concentration actually reached by the American economy. According to the statistics given and explained in chapters 7 and 9 and appendices 9 through 13 of the report that bring up to date the figures published in 1930 by Burl and Means in The Modern Corporation and Private Property, the 100 largest manufacturing companies of this country in 1935 employed 20.7% of all the manpower engaged in manufacturing accounting for 32.4% of the value of products reported by all manufacturing plants and contributed 247 of all the value added in manufacturing activity. Although there are some cases in which these large corporations comprise almost the whole of a particular industry, steel, petroleum, refining, rubber, and cigarette manufacturing, Manufacturing industries on the average cannot compete with the much higher degree of concentration that has been reached by the railroads and public utilities. Of the total number of the 200, quote, largest non-financial corporations, end quote, that are listed in the report, approximately half are railroads and utilities. The railroads included in this list in 1935 operated over 90% of the railroad mileage of the country, while the electric utilities accounted for 80% of the electric power production. For most of the telephone and telegraph services of the USA, and a large part of the rapid transit facilities of New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, and Baltimore. No less striking are the figures related to the 50, quote, largest financial corporations, end quote, including 30 banks, 70 li 17 life insurance companies, and three investment trusts, each with assets over $200 million. The 30 banks together hold 34.3% of the banking assets of the country outside of the Federal Reserve Banks, while the 17 life insurance companies account for over 81.5% of the assets of, the all, of all life insurance companies. There is an equally high degree of concentration in the field of government activities. The 20, quote, largest government units, end quote, together employ 46% of all the manpower employed in government, excluding work relief programs. The largest of these, the federal government, is by far the largest single, quote, corporation, end quote, in the country. The post office alone employed in 1935 nearly as many persons as the largest corporate employer. All these figure, however, do not all these figures, however, do not tell half the story of American business concentration. Much more is shown by a breakdown of the total number into major industrial categories and by the investigation into the growth of the relative importance of all nine financial corporations in nineteen oh nine to over fifty four percent in 1933. The, the whole picture begins to reveal its true significance when the report endeavors to show the tremendous degree of interrelationship through which the quote, managements of most of the larger corporations are brought together in what might be called the corporate community, end quote. This is indeed a picture that might cure the illusions of the most innocent believers in that, quote, spirit of free enterprise, end quote, that must be protected by, quote, all means short of war, end quote, from the sinister threat of, quote, totalitarianism, end quote. There is very little difference between that economic, quote, coordination, end quote, that is achieved and sometimes not achieved by the political decrees of victorious Nazism, fascism, and Bolshevism, and this new, quote, corporate community, end quote, that has been created by a slow but relentless process in this country through the system of, quote, interlocking directorates, end quote, through the activities of the major financial institutions, through particular in invest interest groupings, through forms through firms rendered legal, through firms rendering legal accounting and similar services, through the activities of the major financial institutions, through particular interest groupings, through firms rendering legal accounting and similar services to the larger corporations, through quote intercorporate stockholdings end quote and a number of other devices. 
After a careful study of the working of all these different devices, the report reaches its climax by disclosing that no less than 106 of the aforementioned 250 largest industrial and financial corporations and nearly two-thirds of their combined assets are controlled by only, quote, eight more or less clearly defined interest groups, end quote. Even this estimate, as pointed out, by the authors themselves falls sh far short of reality. Quote, no attempt is made to include the assets of smaller corporations falling within the same sphere of influence, though many such could be named, end quote. Other and more important shortcomings will be discussed below. To give an idea of the significance of this fact, we must restrict ourselves to a few data concerning each of these eight mammoth groups. One, Morgan First International includes 13 industrial corporations, 12 utilities, 11 major railroads or railroad systems, controlling 26% of the railroad mileage of the country, and five banks. Total, total assets. Uh, I'm not going to read that. Total assets with uh, industri industrials, utilities, rails, and banks uh, to $30,210 million. Two, Rockefeller controls six oil companies, successor to the Dissolved Standard Oil Co., representing $4,262 million, or more than half of the total assets of the oil industry and one bank. Chase National, the country's largest bank, assets $2,351 million. Three, Kuhn Loeb, controls 13 major railroads or railroad systems, 22% of the railroad mileage of the country, one utility, one bank, total assets $10,853 million. Four, Mellon, controls about nine industrial corporations, one railroad, two utilities, two banks. Total assets, $3,332 million. Five, Chicago Group, controls on the basis of interlocking directorates, four industrial corporations, three utilities, four banks. Total assets, $4,266 million. 6. DuPont comprises three top rank industrial corporations and one bank. Total assets $2,628 million. 7. Cleveland Group. The Mather interests control, through the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Co., the four so called independent steel companies, control two other industrial corporations and one bank. Total assets. $1,404 million. 8. Boston Group includes four industrial corporations, two utilities, one bank. Total assets $1,719 million. In interpreting this list, the reader should have in mind that it is far from complete. As we have seen, the authors, on principle, have only considered interconnections between the 250 largest non-financial and financial corporations. Even within these limits, many corporations that are, quote, fairly closed related with one another. Uh, even within these limits, many corporations that are, quote, fairly closely related with one another, with one or another of these groups, end quote, have been left out for technical reasons, end quote. For example, the giant international paper and power corporation that is equally closely related to Boston and Rockefeller was therefore assigned to neither the Boston nor the Rockefeller groups. Ten equally important links between the eight big interest groups are considered in the appendix but are only slightly touched upon in the body of the report. Even with these restrictions, the corporate community, as described in this report, appears as a momentous concentration of economic and thus also of political power. The report does not deny the importance of the controls that the corporate community, quote, 
exercises over the policies of the larger corporations, through them affecting the whole American economy, end quote. It is equally aware of the pol their political significance. Just as the control is exercised by the organized interest groups, the big associations of capital and labor, by organization of farmers and of consumers, operate through government, so also do, quote, some of the controls exercised by the corporate community operate through government, end quote. Yet, says the report, quote, it is not intended to imply that these aggregations of capital ever act as a unit under the rule of individual or oligarchic dictatorships. The social and economic content of the relationships which bind them together is far more subtle and varied than this, end quote. It would not be easy to determine just what degree of subtlety and variety separates a democratic from a dictatorial exercise of an uncontrolled power. We have to trust instead the judgment of our experts when they tell us that the corporate community as existing in the United States today is not a dictatorship. It is only a, quote, concentration of the economic leadership in the hands of a few, end quote. The End of the Market The foregoing description of the degree of concentration reached by American capitalism does not by itself answer the crucial question as to whether the present structure of this democracy still conforms to the traditional principles of, quote, democratic, end quote, capitalism, or whether it really, it already, or whether it already assumes the characteristic features of present-day Nazi, fascist, and Bolshevik economies. Recent history has shown that a, quote, totalitarian, end quote, form of government could just as well be imposed upon the comparatively backward economies of Russia, Italy, Spain, and so on, as upon that most highly concentrated type of capitalist economy which existed in Germany. On the other hand, it would be, quote, theoretically, end quote, possible to imagine a development by which a highly concentrated capitalist economy would still retain in an unaltered form the whole of the internal structure of 19th century capitalism. The actual truth that is revealed in, in another, and to the writer, most significant part of Dr. Mean's report is that this miracle has not happened and that, on the contrary, the external change of the structure of the American economy has been accompanied by an even more incisive transformation in its internal structure and operating policies. American economy today no longer receives its decisive impulses from the competition of individual enterprises in an uncontrolled, quote, free, end quote, market, but has become by and large a manipulated system. Goods are still produced as commodities. There is still something that is called, quote, prices, end quote, and there are still the three capitalist, quote, markets, end quote, goods, labor, and securities. There even remain, a, there even remain some sizable areas in which the, quote, price of an article can still act ap after a fashion as a, regular, as a regulator of production, end quote. The, quote, proportion of cotton and corn planted on Arkansas farms varies from year to year with changing relationships and prices of those crops and reflects the operation of markets as an organizing influence, end quote. Yet outside of those increasingly restricted areas, agricultural products and listed securities, the bulk of, quote, prices, end quote, including labor rates, are no longer established in free markets. They are manipulated by administrative decisions that are influenced by a varying extent they, they are manipulated by administrative decisions that are influenced to a varying extent, but no longer, as of old, strictly and directly determined by market conditions. This appears, for example, in the wholesale price of automobiles and agricultural implements that are set and changed from time to time by the respective manufacturers, and thus result from, quote, administrative, end quote, decisions. The reader should be careful here to distinguish between those elements within the, quote, administrative, end quote, organization of production that have long existed and have changed in degree of importance only, and that other aspect 
that is entirely new and is still widely ignored by the traditionally minded economists. The mere fact that administrative rule replaces the mechanism of the market in the coordination of economic activities within the limits of a single enterprise has no novelty for the Marxist. It is true that even this fact assumes a new importance under conditions of modern concentration, when, as in the case of America's largest enterprise, AT&T, the activities of over 450,000 persons are coordinated within one administrative system. It is also true that there has been a great increase in the proportion in which the economic activities of the producing community are, administrative, are administratively coordinated within single enterprises as against that in which they are still coordinated through the shifting of prices and the interaction of a large number of independent sellers and buyers in the market. The decisive problem, however, that has to be investigated if one wants to grasp the process that has recently undermined the traditional democratic character of American society is contained in the question of how far that change of proportion reflects itself in the whole structure and operation of present-day American economy. It is the great merit of the authors of this report that they have investigated that decisive problem to the full and that they are absolutely unambiguous and outspoken about the results of their investigation. According to them, American economy as a whole has been transformed, quote, from one regulated by impersonal competition to one in which policies are administratively determined, end quote. They never tire of repeating this most important result and of describing in most impressive terms the, quote, significance of the extensive role of administrative prices, end quote, that appears to be, quote, inherent in the modern economy, end quote, and forms, quote, an integral part of the structure of economic activity, end quote. They insist again and again that, quote, however much of a role price administration may have played in the earlier years of this century, there can be little question that it plays a dominant role today, end quote. There is no space here to describe in detail the 101 methods and the devices by which prices, apparently settled by the law of supply and demand in an open market, are in fact manipulated and controlled by very definite, quote, price policies, end quote, of the decisive strata of the, quote, corporate community, end quote. These controls may originate from one or one or from different foci of control, quote, the threads of control over labor policy may be divided between the corporation and the labor union, some threads focusing in the corporate management and some in the union officials. Threads of control over some aspects of policy may rest with the government bodies, as in the case of minimum working standards or public utility regulations. Still other threads may rest with some dominant buyer or a supplier of raw materials or services, etc. End quote. They may further be direct and immediate or indirect and intangible. Quote, they may operate simply through establishing a climate of opinion within which policies are developed. End quote. They may be entirely informal or may be accomplished by a formal setting. <coughs> they may be entirely informal or may be accomplished by a formal setting. And in many cases, the formal and the actual lines of control will differ. They arise from three main sources, possession of one or more of the, quote, factors of production, end quote, possession of liquid assets, and most important, position in relation to functioning operation. The main thing to understand is that the new, quote, structure of controls, end quote, that emerges from these various forms of non-market control, one, is entirely a child of modern times, two, it has come to stay for a very long time. The control thus exercised over prices and markets on a nationwide scale by the leading members of the industrial community far surpass in importance the well-known non-market controls heretofore exercised by financial institutions through the handling of investment funds, the so-called supremacy of finance capital. In fact, as shown by recent investigations not yet included in this report, most of the largest business firms are today, quote, self-financing, end quote and no longer depend on the aid of the moneylender and his organization. The strictly, quote, private, end quote, controls exercised by the administrative acts of the members of the corporate community are even more important than the old and new forms of non-market controls which are exercised by government, 
federal, state, and local through its fiscal policies, through the protection of property and enforcement of contracts, and so forth. Nor can the influence exerted on the market by the action of some powerful pressure groups any longer be regarded as a transitory and unquote normal end quote encroachment on the normal the normal activities of trade any more than the influences exerted on the U.S. Congress by political pressure groups in Washington can be considered an anomaly. The constitution of the corporate community has become the real constitution of the U.S. There remains the question of the working of this new system. How can, quote, administration-dominated prices, end quote, that are changed from time to time replace the practically unlimited flexibility of market prices, both in their reaction to the different phases of the industrial cycle, prosperity and depression, and to the technologically conditioned structural changes? Dr. Means and his staff are inclined to take a very optimistic attitude towards the working of the new type of administration domination, administration dominated prices. They clearly see certain, quote, violent distortions, end quote, that arose during the years of the last depression and the succeeding, quote, recovery, end quote, from the differential behavior of the two kinds of prices coexisting in American economy. Quote, between 1929 and 1932, there was a considerable drop in the wholesale price index. But this drop was made of a violent drop in the prices of market-dominated commodities, and there was only a very small or no drop at all for the bulk of the prices, which are subject to extensive administrative control. In the recovery period of 1932 to 1937, much of this distortion was eliminated. By the perhaps new distortions... In the recovery period of 1932 to 1937, much of this distortion was eliminated by the large increases in the market-dominated prices and the relatively small increase in the bulk of administration-dominated prices, end quote. Yet they do not blame this disturbance on the new phenomenon of administration control of prices. They rather take it for granted that the market, though, quote, theoretically, end quote, still able to act as an organizing influence, does in fact no longer act in that beneficial manner. On the other hand, they have proved to their own satisfaction that the degree of flexibility which results from the administrative regulation of the bulk of the prices of goods, labor and securities, quote, appears sufficient to allow the gradual readjustment of price relationships to reflect the gradual changes in wants, in resources, and in techniques of production, if the level of economic activity were reasonably well maintained." End quote. Thus to the authors of this report, quote, the serious distortions in the price structure resulting from the differential sensitivity of prices to depression influences reflect a disorganizing rather than an organizing role of the, that the market can play. End quote. This statement might be acceptable to us who are equally convinced, though from an altogether opposite viewpoint, of the impossibility of retaining or restoring the traditional forms of capitalist economy. It seems, however, that they take a lot for granted if they assume that the level of economic activity could be reasonably well maintained under existing conditions of the, quote, democratic society. They do not tell us in what way they think that this condition will be better fulfilled in the near future than it has been during the recent past. It is quite possible that this omission betrays on the part of the authors an unconscious anticipation of a future dictator who will fill this apparent gap in the structure of the American economy. The only hint of a solution of this crucial problem that we were able to discover in the report is its pathetic appeal to a, quote, increased understanding of the problem on the part of leaders of business, labor leaders, farm leaders, political leaders, and other leaders of public thinking, end quote. The Viewpoint of the Workers We do not propose to discuss the, quote, task, end quote, of the workers. The workers have already too long done other people's tasks, imposed on them under high-sounding names of humanity, of human progress, of justice, and freedom, and whatnot. It is not... It is, one of the redeeming feature, it is one of the redeeming features of a bad situation that some of the illusions hitherto surviving among the working class from their past participation in the revolutionary fight of the bourgeoisie against feudal society have finally been exploded. 
the only, quote, task, end quote, for the workers, as for every other class, is to look out for themselves. The first thing, then, that the workers can do is to make absolutely clear to themselves that the old system of, quote, free trade, quote, free competition, and, quote, democracy has actually come to an end. It does not matter so much whether we describe the new system that has replaced it in terms of, quote, monopoly capitalism, quote, state capitalism, or a, quote, corporate state, end quote. The last term seems most appropriate to the writer for the reason that it recalls at once the name that was given to the new totalitarian form of society after the rise of fascism in Italy 20 years ago. There is, however, a difference. The corporate community of the United States represents as yet only the, quote, economic basis, end quote, of a full-fledged totalitarian system and not its political and ideological superstructure. On the other hand, one might say that in backward countries like Italy and Spain, there exists, as yet, only the totalitarian superstructure without a fully developed economic base, basis. As to, quote, monopoly, end quote, there is no doubt that every increasing concentration of capital is tantamount to an increase in monopoly. The term itself, however, has changed its meaning since a predominantly competitive economy has been superseded by a predominantly monopolistic system. As long as, quote, monopoly, end quote, was regarded as an exception, if not an abuse, the emphasis was on the, quote, excessive, end quote, and, quote, unfair, end quote, profits derived from a monopolistic position within an otherwise competitive economy. An observation made by Marx at an earlier time in his critique of Proudhon has recently been unconsciously accepted by an increasing number of bourgeois economists. Quote, competition, said Marx, quote, implies monopoly and monopoly implies competition, end quote. Thus the terms, mon quote, monopoly, end quote, and quote, competition, end quote, have recently been redefined to refer to the, quote, elements of a situation, end quote, rather than to the situation itself, which as a whole is neither entirely monopolistic nor entirely competitive. In a sense, it can be said today that all or most profits are essentially monopolistic profits, just as the bulk of prices have become monopolistic prices. Monopoly has become not an exceptional, but general condition of present-day economy. Thus, it is quite correct to describe the historical process here discussed as a transition from competitive to monopolistic capitalism, but the term monopoly has, by the very generalization of the condition to which it refers, become an entirely descriptive term, no longer fit to arouse any particular moral indignation. Similarly, there is no serious harm in describing American economy... There is no serious harm in describing American economy as a system of, quote, state capitalism, end quote. Yet this description does not fit American conditions so well as it does the general pattern of German and other European societies. In spite of these special powers of coercion invested in the political authorities alone, <coughs> the administrative decisions emanating from various economic enterprises controlled by the government have become the most important influences exerted by the government on the functioning of the U.S. economy. They are coordinated with all other forms of non-market controls, which, together with the still existing remainders of market controls, constitute the essential features of the, quote, control structure, end quote, of the present economic system. The authors of the report use the term, quote, administration, end quote, quote, administrative rules, end quote, and so on indifferently with reference to all kinds of non-market controls, whether they originate from governmental agencies, from different kinds of organizations based on business enterprises. Excuse me. The authors of the report use the term, quote, administration, end quote, quote, administrative rules, end quote, and so on indifferently with reference to all kinds of non-market controls, whether they originate from governmental agencies, from different kinds of organizations based on business interests, or, for that matter, on labor, farmer, consumer interests, or from private firms and combines. There is no doubt that the position of the government will be considerably strengthened in the case of war, but even this would not be a decisive reason to call the existing system of American economy a, quote, state capitalism, end quote, as the same condition will occur in all countries at war, whether they are backward or fully developed. 
quote, competitive, end quote, or quote, monopolistic, end quote, whether they are based on a scattered or a concentrated system of capitalist production. The second thing the workers may be expected to do once the importance of the exchange and the basic conditions of capitalist economy has been fully experienced and grasped by them is to reshuffle their hitherto most cherished revolutionary and class ideas. When Marx described capitalist society as being fundamentally a, quote, production of commodities, end quote, this term included for him and was meant to include for all those who would be able to understand the peculiar, quote, dialectical, end quote, slang of the whole old Hegelian philosophy, the whole of the suppression and exploitation of the workers in a fully developed capitalist society, the class struggle and its increasingly stronger forms, up to the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism and its replacement by a socialist society. This is all right as far as it goes, except that today it should be translated into a less mysterious and much more distinct and outspoken language. But Marx's emphasis on, quote, commodity production, end quote, included something else, and this time something that may well have become inadequate for the workers' fight against the two species of the, quote, corporate state, end quote, that exist in the fascist and the so-called democratic countries today. The emphasis on the principle of commodity production, that is production for exchange for an anonymous and ever-extended market, was at the same time an emphasis on the positive and progressive functions that capitalism was to fulfill by expanding modern, quote, civilized, end quote, society all over the world, and as Marx said, quote, transforming the whole world into one gigantic market for capitalist production, end quote. All kinds of illusions were inevitably bound up with the great enterprise that was conducted, as it were, by humanity itself. All problems seemed to be solvable. All contradictions and conflicts transitory, and the greatest happiness for the greatest number ultimately obtainable. The workers in all their divisions had a big share in those illusions of commodity production and their political expression, the illusions of democracy. They shared them with all other suppressed minorities and progressive strata of capitalist society, Jews, Negroes, pacifists, all, quote, reformism, end quote, end quote, revisionism, end quote, that distracted the workers' energies from their revolutionary aims had been based on those illusions. The very advent of fascism in the world and its intrusion into the inner sanctums of traditional democracy has at last destroyed the strength of those illusions. We shall attempt in a later article to trace the positive features of a new program for the workers in their fight against the class enemy in his new and more oppressive form, which at the same time is more transparent and more exposed to their attack.